Another season of the NBA on ESPN is underway. Let's go! Deep three. Tyler Hero. Oh, he did it. We have a left off. Coming out to three. <laughs> If you didn't think you had enough plans for your Sunday fun day, how about spending your afternoon in sunny Los Angeles, or at least on your couch, watching the Battle of L.A., a perfect appetizer before Easter Sunday dinner as Lakers Clippers take center stage for NBA Sunday primetime. And for the next 30 minutes, we'll set you up proper for this afternoon tip-off at 3.30 Eastern on ABC. As we welcome you into Hoopstream's primetime, coming to you live on Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, and the ESPN app. Yes, Jacoby. Yes, Jacoby. We got David Jacoby, host of Jalen Jacoby, coming to us live from the New York studios. And we got Brian Windhorse coming from the Cobra Dome. Guys, happy Easter to both of you. I, I do have a very pressing question to start things off. Um, so I was a big fan of Peeps growing up. Like, I was ride or die. I hadn't had an in a really long time. I had one out of my daughter's Easter basket. And it was maybe the worst thing I've ever eaten in my entire life. I've done a full 180 on it. Jacoby, yay or nay to Peeps? Absolutely no Peeps, no candy corn. Any seasonal candy <laughs> is seasonal for a reason. <sighs> Keep that in mind. It, Brian? That seems like a pretty hot take, to be honest with you. Uh, I will say this. There were peeps in my three-year-old's Easter basket, but he has not touched them yet. So I think he's voting with his stomach on that one. Yeah, I, try, <laughs> I, I gave it to my daughter, and she was like, nah, I'll pass. And I was like, try it. And then I tried to go, and I threw the whole thing out. Anyways, just need to get that important matter out of the way. Um, guys, it's, a, it's an exciting weekend of basketball. I mean, that game last night, that was one of the best basketball games that I've seen this season for sure. Um, obviously, college basketball is ruling the weekend, Final Four weekend. We have the Women's Championship tonight on ESPN at 6 Eastern, and then the Men's Final tomorrow. But this afternoon belongs to the NBA, and uh, that's why we wanted to do something to, to set us up right as we're in this home stretch to the NBA playoffs. So we're doing the road to the finals four, where I'm going to ask you guys four of the biggest topics in the league. So the first of our four road to the finals questions is the consistently spicy topic of the MVP. Now, before I get your picks, I spoke to Jamal Murray um, last week as part of our Hoop Streams YouTube series, and he weighed in on who his MVP is, and I'm sure you can take a guess. For those who may be casuals, if you will, and uh, only see Jokic's name in the MVP race with Joel and LeBron, um, but don't understand or taking the time to see just what he's possible of. Uh, what can you say about Jokic um, and how he's been playing this season and, and what it's like being his teammate? It's amazing. I come off and pick and roll. I get whether they switch or not. My feed big fella. It's like, yeah, I'm open, but he's finding guys. He's looking people off. He's scoring whatever he wants. He's playing defense, getting deflections, throwing full court passes. He's 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 been amazing. There's nothing else to say. He can literally give him the ball and he'll make anything happen. Uh, he makes everybody better. Uh, he's so unselfish. Um, he's looking to pass. He's looking to make a play for others. And he's the system of our offense. It's just amazing how easy he makes it look and how easy he makes the game. Uh, I look for not just him, but for everybody. It's a lot of fun to play. So Jamal said his teammate is the MVP, and you can argue for his campaign. It's been the most consistent so far this season, but with Embiid returning last night, uh, LeBron TBD, Jacoby, I'm going to go to you first. Who is your front runner right now for the MVP? Well, right now, my front runner is different than who I think is going to win. Now, you said the most consistent would be Jokic. I think that might be true. Giannis might have something to say that as well. He's got a, had a very healthy, consistent season. But I think the winner of this year's MVP award, which is going to be one of the closest votes we've ever seen in our entire lives, is going to be James Harden. Mm. And why? Because I think when it gets down to it, and you look at Dame, and you look at Jokic, and you look at Giannis, and you look at Harden, you start to look at team success. And they're going to get Durant back soon. 
and they are probably, I don't know, in the next 30, 40 minutes are going to be the number one team in the Eastern Conference. And the further we get away from the stink of hanging out with little baby in Vegas and sort of mailing in in Houston and not asking for a trade, but really asking for a trade, the further we get away from that, the less we remember it. And he's putting up 26 points, leading the league in assists. And this team is an absolute juggernaut heading into the final stretch. So I think team success, plus with what he's been able to do on the court, is going to make James Harden ultimately the MVP. Mm. Brian? Cassie, Cassie, wouldn't it be hilarious if you asked somebody whose teammate was a candidate for MVP and they didn't say their teammate? Like, exactly. if you would ask Jamal, who should be the MVP? And he was like, I think it should be LeBron. Actually, that did happen once to a team I was covering, the Cavs and LeBron's first year back. Uh, somebody asked Kevin Love who the MVP was, and he said Russell Westbrook, his former teammate at UCLA. Right. And LeBron was like, what? Say what? It caused a problem. So Fitting I respect out. Jamal out there. Jokic. <laughs> And, and Jokic is an absolutely acceptable answer, and, and he may win it. I think he's the betting favorite the last time mm -hmm. I checked. But I, if I had to cast my vote today, I would be weighing between Embiid and Harden. And, and you know, there's a lot of factors going into this. Uh, one of them is, is that I just think that Jan, the, the, the bar for Giannis to clear to win a third straight MVP is probably too high, considering he hasn't gotten it done in the playoffs the last two years. And you may retort to that and say, well, what does that have to do with this season? The answer is nothing and everything, because voting has a narrative. And it's the narrative that's working against James Harden that Jacoby just mentioned, that Harden has to get past the concept that he forced his way out of a situation. But guess what? With each passing week and the Rockets becoming more of a mess, Harden's forcing of that trade looks even better in my view. And not only that, he's playing spectacularly. And so Embiid is back now, and I know he's only played, you know, in the low 30 number of games, but he's been awesome. So to me, it's down the stretch between those two guys, and I will take everything that happens in the rest of the way under advisement. I mean, Embiid really was, for me, um, and maybe it's because I, I, I've covered a lot of Sixers games um, this year. He was the runaway favorite before for, before the injury. Um, and now that he's back, it's going to be interesting to see. And, and, the, and the Sixers really held it down without him, so I'm not sure if that, that works in his favor or against him. I would say it works in his favor. So, I, like I said, it's going to be a hotly contested um, debate all the way down to the end. You can even throw Damian Lillard in there and what he's doing for the Trailblazers. There's uh, so many names um, that that are that really have a case. Now, as I said, that conversation is going to go down to the final week, no doubt. Question number two in our road to the finals four is one that seemed that we really had the answer to, um, but now with LaMelo Ball lost for the season with a fractured wrist, um, he was still named the Rookie of the Month for March uh, for the East, by the way. Uh, he, he only played eight games in March. Um, you know, I, who's right now your front runner, Brian, for Rookie of the Year, given the situation with LaMelo Ball? Yeah, I know it's difficult with LaMelo, but I, I saw what I needed to see, and I intend to vote him for Rookie of the Year. Now, Anthony Edwards and Tyrese Halliburton's cases are not done, and so that's why we wait until the end of the season to vote. But to me, the defining category for a rookie to, to prove his value is can he impact winning and losing? That sounds like a simple statement, but that is very rare that that happens. Uh, really only a handful of guys in the last 10, 15 years I can name. And I really honestly believe that LaMelo influenced winning and losing with the Hornets this year. His performances in so many of those games were the difference maker. I don't think Halliburton and Anthony Edwards rise to that level, even though I respect how they're playing. And so my vote will be with LaMelo. And, you know, I voted, I voted for rookies in the past that have only played in the mid-30s. To me, it's just either you see a representative season or you don't. I think in this case I did, and that's my intention, to go with LaMelo. Now, Jacoby, before we hear your answer, because we know you've been pretty much the president of the LaMelo Ball fan club, I spoke with Anthony Edwards this week. Um, he was the West Rookie of the Month. He led all rookies with 24.2 points per game to go along with five rebounds, two assists, and one steal over 13 games. Um, and listen to what he had to say about if he has extra motivation now that he knows LaMelo Ball is out for the season. You're just 19 years old. We all know number one overall pick going from, from hot Georgia to the Minnesota winter. And you were on fire in March. And you, you averaged over 24 points per game, the third most in a calendar month by a teenager in NBA history behind, oh, Carmelo Anthony and LeBron James. So you really seem to be turning it on here down the stretch. Do you think you're deserving of the rookie of the year right now? I can't really. Uh you know, say what other people 
opinion is about me. But yeah, I feel like I, I got a chance. That's all I can say. I feel like I got a chance. And as long as I keep showcasing my talent, I feel like I'm, a, I'm always have a chance. That's all I can ask for. And anyone who's been paying attention and, and knows you could also be in the conversation for Defensive Player of the Year. Your defense has just been consistent all year. Um, but on the offensive end, you know, have you been motivated at all by maybe the early criticisms of your shooting or maybe even the injury to LaMelo Ball to push yourself more um, to get into this Rookie of the Year conversation? Uh, Melo, my boy, I don't, I don't wish, you know, being out missing games on anybody. I wish he was playing right now. You know what I'm saying? If he if he was a Rookie of the Year, if he was going to win it, then, you know what I'm saying? I'm happy for him. I'm, I can't knock somebody because they hurt. When he was playing, he deserved it. You know what I'm saying? They was winning. He was playing good. And like I said, that's my boy. So I always want to see people in my draft class do good and succeed. So, because they said how bad our draft class was. So I ain't really, I wasn't really paying attention to none of that. I'm just trying to figure out how to win game. So Jacoby, is there any way in your mind that LaMelo Ball loses the rookie of the year this season? First of all, um, you know, our colleague here, Mr. Windhorst, is a respected journalist, which is why he has a vote. I do not. However, if I did have a vote, I would definitely vote LaMelo Ball. However, Anthony Edwards has had such an opportunity because the Timberwolves are such a trash franchise at the moment <laughs> oh because they give him the ball. Really? He can shoot it 20 times. He can shoot it 30 times. The numbers are going to be in Anthony Edwards' favor, and I love his personality. But when you watch these two gentlemen, who are both great players and will be stars in this league, LaMelo Ball just has an innate passing ability. He's a playmaker. He affects winning, as Brian Windhorst mentioned. Like, I think that at the end of the day, because he's going to be on the floor, hopefully, Anthony Edwards might win this award. But to me, the most impactful rookie, the person who I would put the most stock in, the person who I would want on my franchise moving forward would be LaMelo Ball because I mean, he gets six rebounds a game. He gets six assists a game, 16 points a game on a team that's performing better than expected. And Anthony Edwards and the Timberwolves are performing much worse than expected, which has allowed him the opportunity to put up the numbers that he has. No disrespect to the Timberwolves on behalf of the Hoop Streams. Uh... Family, or maybe disrespect. Look, just to, just to put the numbers in perspective, LaMelo um, has played 41 games. It will be out of 72 regular season games this season, whereas, uh, you know, the, the argument against Joel Embiid, when he played 31 out of 82, um, is, I, I, I think 41 out of 72 is a, is a, is a good sample size, but I, I do want to see what other kind of action um, Anthony Edwards uh, has in store for, for everybody because he, he, he can grab the attention of NBA fans, that's for sure. All right, question number three of our road to the finals four. Let's focus first on the Eastern Conference. Brian, uh, what is the storyline that has your attention right now in the East? Well, the bottom half of the East is just falling away just – terribly so there's not much going on there except sadness so we have to focus at the top and one of the things I think might have might matter is home court advantage in the potential conference final series between the 76ers and Nets by by you know late June we may see these arenas relatively full and the 76ers over the last two years have been the best home team in the NBA home court means a lot to the 76ers so these teams have been neck and neck, trading back and forth the last couple of weeks. Embiid is back. Durant should be back uh, in the next day or two. We're going to see them hopefully at full power. A race to the finish to who gets that home court. And because neither of these teams have proven that they can get there yet, I think home court could be the difference. So I'm keeping an eye on that race heading down the stretch. Just a reminder, maybe turning the frown upside down for the, the, the sad part of the bottom of the East as we have the play-in <laughs> tournament. Um, finishing seventh or eighth uh, no longer guarantees you a spot um, in the play-in tournament. It's the loser of the seven versus eight has to play the winner of nine versus ten with the winner advancing to the playoffs. So, I mean, I'm excited for the play-in tournament. So there's at least something um, if your team is in that sad back end of the East. Jacoby, the storyline you're paying attention to right now in the East. Well, it's also sad. <laughs> I mean, we knew that the Sixers were going to contend. We knew the Nets would contend even before they added, um, I don't know, James Harden and LaMarcus Aldridge and Blake Griffin. But I didn't expect the Celtics to be this bad. I mean, this team was deep in the playoffs. It was a bubble situation, so we thought maybe they would turn around, and they've just had so much trouble winning games. We're 49 games into a 7-2 game season. They're below 500. They're below the New York Knicks right now, and they've got Tatum and Brown, but they were having a lot of trouble with their bigs. 
Uh, Thompson's been in and out of the news for various reasons, in and out of COVID protocol. They're playing Mo Wagner and Luke Cornett right now. They don't have Tice anymore. They really need Time Lord to step up. Like, I'm just so surprised at how bad this team is right now. They're below 500, and I was, they're a team that I expected to be in the conversation that may be coming out of the East. Right now, they're in the conversation for maybe hosting a game one in round one, maybe? Yeah, you're right. It is sad in Boston right now. If it, it, it feels real heavy, it feels like all of those guys, especially Jalen and Jason, they're carrying a lot of I don't even know stuff on their shoulders right now. Um, before we wrap up, I just want to ask one question about the Eastern Conference, and it has to do with Drew Holiday. He agreed to a four-year, 135 million dollar extension that includes bonuses, according to uh, Woj. Brian, quickly, your thoughts on that? Well, when they traded those three first-round picks and those pick swaps for him, they had to extend his contract. They had to re-sign him. He knew that, and it, it, they negotiated for almost a month before getting to this, and they had to pay him big dollars. And here's the thing. Cassidy, they can't afford to let him walk out the door, so they have to pay him this money. Will it be a good contract? I don't know. We'll find out in the playoffs. I'm going to tell you this. They've got $530 million tied up in Drew Holiday, Chris Middleton, and Giannis Antetokounmpo. That's their big three, for better or worse. Let's see what happens. Yeah, Drew's saying he's a buck for life and loves the family-oriented atmosphere in Milwaukee. All right, our fourth question in the road to the finals for let's focus on the West. Brian, what is your storyline that you uh, are focused on right now out West? Yeah, it's the Lakers. It's the Lakers, 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 and not so much their seed. I know people were worried that they may have slipped into the play-in zone. They've actually kept their head above water over the last 10 days or so. They've gotten three wins in the last four games without LeBron and AD. I'm not worried about their seed. I'm worried about the health of their two studs. You know, AD has been out now approaching two months with this, uh, with this Achilles issue. And LeBron is, you know, he's never had this injury before. I have no doubt he'll come back relatively soon, within two or three weeks. But the question is, how is it going to linger him and how is it going to affect? Because every, every round in the Western Conference is going to be difficult. So to me, it's the health of AD and LeBron is going to determine the Western Conference this year. Jacoby? It's, it's, as Wendy said, it's Lakers, Lakers, Lakers. They've got LeBron, they've got AD, but wait, they don't have LeBron and AD. Yeah. And I love chaos. I'm kind of like the Joker. I just want to see the world burn. I want to see the Lakers get into the play, uh, the play in, and then get the seventh seed. And then imagine you're the Phoenix Suns. You've had a, a, a season, a season unlike any other in the history of the franchise. You end up with the two seed, and then you have to play the Lakers <laughs> in the first round. It's just, it just seems so unjust and so chaotic that that is what I want to see. But it really is all about the Lakers and how far they slide and how they can keep their head above water, as Wendy put so eloquently in this playoff race. Yeah, and, you know, we're going to get a preview tonight or this afternoon. The Lakers without... AD and LeBron taking on the, this Clippers team, which, um, you know, no disrespect to the Utah Jazz, I think is a, the, the game a lot of people are um, hoping to see maybe in the Western Conference Finals. Now, Brian, uh, thank you so much for taking the time to join us on Hoop Streams. Make sure to listen to the Hoop Collective wherever you download podcasts. And, of course, you can check out Brian Windhorse on the jump with our Rachel Nichols during the week. And Rachel sat down with Rajon Rondo and talked about his goals with his new team, the Clippers, and what it's going to be like facing his former team, the Lakers, today. So let's talk Lakers-Clippers. There's been an edginess between the two teams, certainly since Kawhi and Paul George came to town. You, of course, experienced that from the Lakers side last year. What is it like to flip to the Clippers side now? Um, it's, it's different. It is uh, a rivalry here in the Los Angeles, but for the most part, I've been getting a bunch of, you know, just welcome backs. You know, it's different coming back to L.A. being a champion, so uh, it hasn't been as brutal as you would think as far as going back from L.A. to Clippers rivalry because, you know, Laker fans are still on the high horse as far as, um, you know, a championship uh, ring this past uh, summer, so um, I'm just looking forward to competition, getting to learn my, my teammates as, as much as possible and competing. It's funny, we have this Sunday game on ABC, Lakers Clippers, and even without LeBron or Anthony Davis, you got a lot of spicy matchups there between former teammates on both sides. What do you think that game is going to be like? It'll be intense. You have competitive guys that were here last year, vice versa, um, and it'll be an interesting game. You know, two great coaches, two great minds uh, going at each other, and uh, two, two great teams. 
Is it going to be a little fun for you because you know those guys so well? It'll be a, a lot of fun for me. You know, anytime I like to see my old teammates, uh, old coaching staff, uh, it's all love and, and, and the fun and competition. What do you think is the ceiling for this Clippers group? Championship. <laughs> I mean, that's it. You, know, you see that? It's pretty much, you know, uh, what, I, what I love is, you know, having that pressure is to see the championship or bust. You know, they've been in the playoffs, but uh, this franchise hasn't won. And um, that is something I'm looking forward to doing, you know, proving a lot of doubters wrong and going against all odds. And we are now joined by the wonderful Rachel Nichols. And as always, you can check out her full interview with Rondo on the ESPN YouTube page. You can also check her out on the sidelines this afternoon for Lakers Clippers at 3.30 Eastern on ABC. And Rach, both these teams have championship or bus mentalities. And starting with the Clippers, they traded away uh, Lou Williams for Rajon Rondo. So, so what are they hoping Rondo can add that Lou Williams, you know, didn't? They really need someone to organize their offense better. Obviously, they've got super high-talented players on this team, most notably Kawhi Leonard, Paul George. But their numbers in the clutch cast, they have not been good. In fact, they're the second to worst in the league in clutch time this season when we look at the efficiency numbers. So Rajam Rondo, that is what he does. As he said to me, he goes, my job is to make Hall of Fame players better. And we saw it with the Lakers last year. You know, Anthony Davis's most notable shot of the entire bubble playoffs was that crazy shot against Denver well it was Rondo inbounding the ball for that shot and he's the one who made a decision in the moment to sort of switch up the play and get the ball to AD because of something he saw so that's exactly what the Clippers would like Rondo to do for them in the playoffs this year he'll be on a little bit of a minutes restriction today both in terms of total minutes and amount of minutes he can play in a stretch Ty Lue said it should take him about two to three weeks to really ramp up with this team, but that ramping up starts today. We'll see what he can do. And there's no more clutch time, period, than the playoffs, and playoff rondo is real. Anyone who doubts real. that, I don't know what you're thinking. Now, uh, for, for the Lakers, LeBron and Anthony Davis still remain out. You have any information on their status going forward? Yeah, Frank Vogel said today it's still going to be a while for Anthony Davis and, of course, even longer for LeBron James. AD is ramping up his on-court work, but he's not close to doing five-on-five -five work in practice. And as we know, that is the gateway to coming back into a game. He was asked if there was a setback with Anthony Davis because he has been out, remember, since Valentine's Day with an injury that they thought was certainly going to have him miss some time, but not this much time. And he said, no, there's been no setback in the calf or any worries about the Achilles. It has just been about ramping him back up so slowly to make sure that they don't have a setback just in practice. So they want to make sure they deliver him to the court fully healthy and ready to go for the postseason. LeBron's still out indefinitely. The initial sort of rough estimate was four to six weeks. He has been working hard, getting up very early to get his workouts <laughs> in. We know how LeBron does. Yep. Uh, but again, they want to make sure that he's in good shape when they get to the postseason. It almost feels like this is their offseason that they didn't get. Um, and that they're resting. At least that's, that's the hope and that they're, they, they are actually on the men's. Um, on top of that for the Lakers, Andre Drummond missed the Lakers last game against the Kings after hurting his toe in his debut. What more can you tell us about his status? He's not going to play. And Cassidy, that is really nice of you to phrase it that way. That's very delicate. <laughs> that's very genteel. The man is missing a toenail. No. His entire toenail came off. No. And Frank Vogel said today that uh, Andre can't even put his shoe on yet. So that he, he, he is definitely away from playing right now. When he can get that shoe on, get some of his mobility back, that is when we will see him on the court. But remember, he had Brooke Lopez come down on top of him. That is nearly 300 pounds of human. Mm. Mm. So I don't care how big you are yourself. Your toe is your toe, and that toenail is it's gone. It's gone, Cassidy. Rachel, I don't even want to put my shoe on thinking about the fact that he's uh, missing a toenail. Like, I'm okay. That's why I said toe injury. I know you got to report the real facts, but I'm good. Uh, again, thank you, Rachel. Again, she'll be on the sidelines at 3.30 Eastern on ABC. And, of course, daily 3 Eastern on the jump. Thanks, Rach. Thanks. All right, you're watching Hoop Streams live on Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, and the ESPN app. To watch Lakers Clippers live in the app, just log into your cable provider now. And look, there's Paul George warming up. The Clippers, they had won six in a row, but dropped their last two games and losses to the Nuggets and Magic. We'll see what they have for the uh, Lakers this afternoon. And 
With that, I now want to welcome in the one and only Om Young Masuk to Hoop Streams. It joins us also with Jacoby. And, and Om, you're, you're outside of the Staples Center. Um, nice you know, view. I had, I had to bring a little California here. You know what I mean? I don't know if you can see the Elgin Baylor statues right behind me. Rest in peace. But, you know, I had to bring some California sun to the show. I appreciate it. It looks beautiful uh, there, and so, and so do you, Ohm. I'm so happy that you're on Hoop Streams. But I, I do want to ask you, we just saw uh, Paul George warming up. You know, he said that toe injury could linger all season, um, and, he, and he has no explosion off of that toe. So uh, how big of a deal is this for him? Cassidy, this is a potentially huge deal for the Clippers because Paul George hurt this toe probably over a month ago, and he missed seven years games and came back and thought he was over it but then it flared back up and then he said the other night that he thinks this potentially could linger the rest of the season and so he and the Clippers are trying to figure out how to manage this injury best but they are worried that this could linger the rest of the season and this is going to be a pain tolerance issue and he said that he cannot explode off that right foot and that toe and even he said the toe next to it he's been flexing it non-stop so this is affecting his ability to finish inside the paint and listen, Paul George was having a bounce back season. It was a revenge season for him up until he hurt this toe. And he has not quite been the same Paul George that he was earlier in the season when he was shooting lights out. I feel like I'm like I, my, my toe is starting to like reverberate here because there was so much toe talk with Drummond and, and Paul George. But Jacoby, when you hear uh, those comments from, from Paul George, I mean, how concerned should Clippers fans be, you know, as we're in this home stretch towards the playoffs? Oh, oh, I'll tell you how concerned they should be because there's something lingering out there. There's the fact that Kawhi Leonard and Paul George are at the end of their deals. So let's just imagine in the hypothetical highway, let's go down the hypothetical highway in which the Clippers, again, like the bubble last year, underperform in the playoffs. And then Kawhi and Paul George and Bomber and, and Ty Lue, they all have to look at each other and say, do we have to change this? There is so much on the line for this Clippers team as we head into the playoffs and in the playoffs because I think if they don't sort of live up to their expectations, you'll see some roster changes with some superstars in Los Angeles on the Clippers. And obviously there's a lot of focus on the Lakers injury problems with their two best players and LeBron and AD out, but the Clippers are banged up too. Oh, and what can you tell us about the status of Patrick Beverly and Serge Ibaka who missed a significant amount of time? Patrick Beverly has recently begun on-court um, activities, and he's getting closer. Uh, Ty Lue said today that uh, is hopefully within, you know, next, maybe the next couple games he could be back. Uh, Serge Ibaka has been – this has been puzzling because initially he hurt his back, and it was kind of just deemed a sore back issue. And, we, you know, I think people thought that he could be back soon, but he is missed now. I think this is going to be his 10th or 11th game out. And he is not really close to coming back. He is just starting to ramp up. He hasn't really been able to do a lot of serious on-court activity yet. So uh, they're going to take their time with Serge Ibaka. They obviously need him for the, for the stretch playoffs. But, you know, look, they got about 23 games, 20-something games left in the season. This is a critical time for the Clippers. As Jacoby said, there could be huge ramifications if they do not meet expectations. And they don't have much time to get this group together. This is starting to feel a little bit like last year, where they had a ton of disruptions, lack of practice time, and they just did not have that continuity and chemistry. Mm. And it really impacted them come playoff time. And we talked earlier with Brian about just the situation with the Lakers uh, possibly finding themselves in, in, in that um, play-in game. But Jacoby, you know, they've won three of their last four games without, of course, Anthony Davis and LeBron James in the lineup. But can this current roster sustain any type of winning momentum without them? And, and as Rachel told us earlier, we really still don't have a timeline um, for, for either of them coming back. Well, one of the things about this Laker roster, which is so important, is when AD and LeBron are healthy, the question is always, who's going to be that third piece? And you saw Kyle Kuzma played really well recently. And you look at Montrez Harrell, you want to get a little bit more from him. Dennis Schroeder is supposed to be that third star. And Gasol, with Drummond not being available, Gasol, you know, he's a little upset about the Drummond acquisition, and I understand that. But this is really a good time for these players that are supposed to be that third piece, that third go-to scorer, to step up and have games like Kuzma had against the Kings.
Well, we just lost Ohm, but, you know, it's about it's almost that time for him to get back into Staples Center because uh, it, 3.30 Eastern is when that game gets underway at ABC. Oh, I think we are hearing him face oh, calling back. He's calling, calling back. back. <laughs> this is the new way of, uh, of you know, Internet television as, as we speak. But I, before we go, as, as we got about 30 seconds left in the show, i got to get your, your, your answer. This is bigger than my peeps question. Talk to me. Talk How to do me. you feel Talk to about me. the Space Jam trailer? Uh, it blew my mind. Like I knew we were getting Space Jam. I knew we were getting Looney Tunes. I didn't know we were getting like Game of Thrones and The Hobbit. And like, it was just like, I didn't know we were getting every movie I've ever seen all in one with LeBron James as the star. I cannot wait to see this movie. There's Diana Taurasi in the background right. playing with White Mamba, a snake. I, there are so many levels to this. I'm, my mind is blown just watching this two and a half minute trailer. I mean, this is blockbuster. You can just feel the money they put into this movie. You got Don Cheadle like being a, a Matrix. Hologram. Yes, the, what in the everything. Matrix hell? I'm I'm fired up. Let's. I mean, this and it's gonna be on HBO Max too. Like I know maybe hopefully we can go to theaters by then. But I'm I'm saying I'm re I'm ready. I am I'm excited um, about you know Space Jam two and LeBron James is. Uh, I, I want to see his. Is this guy, he's the he's the lead. You know, this is a oh, yeah. lead role for him. So we'll, we'll see how, how it all plays out in that, in that movie. So, um, Jacoby, thank you for spending the whole show with us oh, here on Hoop course, Streams. Cass. We're back Anytime. next week for Nets Lakers, 8 Eastern, Ooh. ahead of that one. We'll see if KD is going to be on the court. I doubt it, but we'll see. It should be a good one. Log into your cable provider. he might be. I'm hearing be. good things about KD. I mean, we'll see. Uh, log into your cable providers now to watch Lakers Clippers in the ESPN app. Thanks for joining us on Hoop Streams. See you guys.